Audi, Ultram, Patem. Did you just think for a second that I was about to tell you the name for the latest Audi car model? Absolutely not. You see, Audi Ultram Patem is one of those legal maxims we as lawyers throw out there to you know, impress our client, the judge, and also to pass some of those exams back at law school. But Audi Ultram Patem actually means that nobody should be judged before they have been heard. It's a principle of fair hearing. So why can't we just say that? Well, that's one of my frustrations as well with the law. It is sometimes too technical, complicated, and unnecessarily complex. So as a lawyer, I have decided to uncomplicate the law by using visuals to make it more relatable, and also understanding the power of visuals to push for justice by highlighting incidences of injustices and human rights violations by using videos and pictures. The last time I was in a courtroom was in 2012. And even though I still engage in legal battles today, I do them through pixels. Because I have come to understand that there is great power in visuals. And not every human rights violation can be explained through court affidavits or legal arguments. It's just difficult to conceptualize some of these violations that a victim has suffered into words. For instance, how would you conceptualize and capture the brokenness of a rape survivor on paper? It is difficult. So we have to come to realize and accept that sometimes trauma and violence is way too large to be broken down into words. 1991, the name Rodney King is one that will not be easily forgotten in the American history. Because in 1991, Rodney King was brutally battered and beaten by police officers, and it was caught on camera. That video, which was captured by a civilian from the balcony of his home in Los Angeles, soon went viral as it appeared on virtually every major news network in America. And this was before the age of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram. I mean, back in those days, I'm sure they were still a figment of the imagination. But that video was important because it did one thing. It validated, again, the claims by the black community that they had been subject to police brutality. And it brought back to the forefront and to the front burner conversations around police brutality, racial inequality, and racial injustice in America. Now, one would have thought that that graphic image would have led to justice, but unfortunately, it did not. Rather, a few months down the line, these police officers were acquitted. However, it did one thing. This visual representation of the beating of Rodney King sparked a debate in America. It also laid the foundations for subsequent successful cases that went on to become movements in America. Let us never underestimate the power of a visual in sparking a debate. Now, a couple of weeks ago, actually, I have a friend from Kenya. She was explaining to me the kind of trauma that she goes through while walking the streets in Kenya. And now she acknowledges that her trauma is not even as vicious as some others staying in places like Malawi and Tanzania. Nonetheless, it's significant enough. And what is it? As a person living with albinism, she sometimes walks the streets and hears people call out saying, see money walking. Because people still believe in the myth that the body parts of persons with albinism can actually make them rich. But this situation actually gets worse because in places like Tanzania and Malawi, people with albinism are practically hunted and killed, and their body parts are sold for as high as $75,000. That is what inspired this campaign, which we launched through the White Coat Center, an organization that we founded to talk about human atrocities and indicate to people why they need to stand up for human rights violation. Here is my friend Sechaba, and we wanted to underscore and emphasize the fact that 
Persons with albinism are humans just like the rest of us. There is no reason why they should be seen as ghosts. Never again underestimate the power of a visual to communicate because in this instance, it was remarkable the kind of responses that we received. For instance, somebody told me and said, I never knew this was a theme. Some of the comments was about how I have never seen a person with, al a person with albinism's obituary before. Did they really die? And then somebody else said, so what can we do about this? And that last sentence is quite significant because a visual does not just give you the permission and the opportunity to be able to react to issues, it also enlightens you and gives you the opportunity to get involved and create change. So how then can we all be part of this disruptive age of creating change through visuals? Now, when I was telling a friend about the fact that my topic was called the visual disruption of injustice, he said, <laughs> Disruption seems to be the new cool word now, but it's not about it being the new cool word. It's about the truth that we truly can disrupt injustice through visuals. And here are the steps I'm gonna take us through on how we can do that. There are four steps I would say. The first is to see. What do you see? I believe that what we see informs what we do. I also believe that seeing is a deeper perception than looking. You know, you can be looking at an abandoned building, but what you're seeing is an opportunity to fill that building with the laughter and sound of children who have been homeless for years and who have now finally found a home. Seeing makes us feel, and it compels us to do something about what we have just seen. So I encourage you, to do more than just look, to see. And after you have seen, to create. Because now, because we have seen and we have felt, what we create will have a lot of heart in it. And it doesn't matter the format and the method in which you create. You could be using your cell phone or you could be using a camera. The point is, you need to tell those untold stories. I remember the very first video that I made with my cell phone. It was in the year 2014, the year when Boko Haram had just captured almost 300 girls from their school in Chibok in northern Nigeria. Like the rest of the world, I was enraged, I was upset. And my friends and I decided to do something about it, so we made a video and we put it up on YouTube. But before you knew it, I was getting emailed by SABC asking if I could grant an interview regarding the video that I had just produced. Of course, I said, well, they didn't even know it was made with a phone until I told them it was. So we had the conversation, we had the interview, we exposed the issues, and it was done. But it would be silly of me to think that the video that I made <laughs> was what led to you know, the Nigerian government taking the the kidnap of these girls more seriously, or the international community coming together to do something more proactively about bringing the girls back. But it also would be unreasonable of me to think that it did not matter, because it did. It contributed to this overwhelming conversation that was ongoing about why the girls had to be brought back. So you see, what we all do, it matters. Imagine if nobody, ever put out any word about bringing back the girls because we thought that probably it would not matter. The visuals that we produce, they do matter. And it matters because silence is not an option. In fact, silence, as a matter of fact, is a form of violence in itself. So let us not stay silent. And then the third point would be that we should move from creating to seeking out impact. Never underestimate the power of a visual to disrupt injustice. And I'm going to give the example of a case that happened back in 2012. There's a man called Thomas Lubanga. He is the first man to ever be convicted by the International Criminal Court. And what was his crime? He was found guilty of recruiting child soldiers under the age of 15 to fight in the war in DRC, which left millions dead. 
Now, the importance of this case is the fact that a video had surfaced showing that these children had been seen in training camps, and this video was relied heavily by the prosecution to prove that Thomas Lubanga indeed had recruited children under the age of 15 to be involved in his hideous crime. This video was recorded courageously by an NGO in DRC. Now, I'm not saying we all should get out there tomorrow armed with cameras to perform covert operations capturing violations of human rights. No. But I am saying that there are those stories that surround us, stories that desire to be told, stories that go beyond the picture of our favorite pizza with pineapples or our favorite sandwich. Let us tell those stories because if we don't, somebody else might not and they may never be heard. And the last point is to repeat. So after we have seen and we have created and we have sought out impact, let us repeat that entire process again. It was Aristotle that said, for the things that we have to learn before we do them, we then have to do them before we can perfect them. So I will say to you that you start and you get out there. You may not get it the first time, but then you eventually will never get it wrong through practice. I believe that our visuals do matter, and as a matter of fact, it has been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. What do you see when you see this picture? I'm here to tell you that even though a picture is worth a thousand words, a picture is also worth a thousand lives. So let us all defend as many lives as we can with the power of our visuals. Some battles we might win, and some we may unfortunately lose. But if the latter were to ever be the case, let it not be because we never tried. <laughs>